Media Camp, and this is the first Open Data Camp uh, we are hosting. I think the first one in, in India. And similar to this, I mean, a few years back, the first Bar Camp in India happened in Bangalore. So, other than that, this presentation is just five years just about the practicals today. So, okay, so most of the things you can read it here. So, <coughs> It's a part time format. It's little, there's a little change that happens. Uh, in the morning, we are going with the fixed schedule. In the afternoon, we have a fixed schedule for this room. But there's a, uh, the other two rooms are like quite free to host, uh, you know, very on conference topic. So these are, as I you, these are the three main halls. Uh, this is the main hall, and there's a food court behind me. There's a meeting hall next. And all the morning sessions will happen here. Uh, and the track of the noon sessions will happen here. And the food court is behind me, where the lunch and tea will be served. And it's also open for informal sessions in the morning. If you don't want to be here, don't want to attend the main sessions, you can come your own room in the, in the food court and have your own resort. And the meeting hall is just behind, you go around and go there. And it, it, it again is free in the morning, you can host your own sessions if you want. Uh, just ask one of the volunteers. And in the afternoon, we have a big session uh, for, the, for all the three rooms. And uh, actually, the, 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 this is about the fixed uh, sessions. I've just put it up for your information. It's on the side too, and it's on the board on the right side as well. So I just put it here. So these are the, like the split in the afternoon. Uh, the, the fixed sessions for the afternoon, but the morning, uh, mornings are free uh, in the meeting room and the food board for you to use for any of uh, your own sessions. And there's again one free slot if somebody wants it, uh, you can block and skip it. And there's uh, feedback time between 6.45 and 4.45 and 6 o'clock. So it's not just feedback, it's just for time to get together and meet other people and whatever talk you want to have. And then uh, uh, it's just a standard part time thing if you want to have your own informal sessions in other two rooms in the morning, so you can just block and uh, limit it to 20 plus 5 minutes most of the time so everybody gets a chance. So, uh, so the internet part two as is there and uh, uh, try to use the tags so people can uh, find the you know, on, on Twitter or TikTok or whatever. And you can do That's it. Uh, if you want any help, you can talk to another volunteer or be a wish. Numbers are probably on the side, so if you want, you can talk to us. That's it. And that's the Google group uh, which is organizing this camp. And you can as well you know, communicate with us. And, and with this, I think we'll go to the first session, which is a, which is a panel discussion. And we shall have a little bit. Welcome, everyone. This um, has been quite uh, an overwhelmingly positive experience organizing this. Um, we, when we first thought we'd have this, we thought, oh, 50 people will come and everyone will be talking about technical things. And then we got such an overwhelmingly great response that um, we knew that this was going to be a good event and that even we're going to have a lot of really interesting diverse people here. People really wanted to. Also, just a quick note, if you have, um, if you want to present an online or uh, computer-based data tech tool, um, instead of, since we have limited uh, space, we can do a, a quick fire tech tool round in the cafeteria in the afternoon, um, which is basically, we'll set up a, a kind of a round, like stations, and you can present your tech tool for, um, 10 minutes to groups who want to like see your tool online and things like that. Just so you can have a chance to show what you, the work you've been working on and what kind of tools that you guys have been creating and we don't have to um, we don't have to fill up the panel space. Um, so if you want to do that, just come talk to me and we'll set up some space in the cafeteria. Um, so. 
Um, we wanted to open the uh, camp with kind of, um, let's talk about what's happening in India and what different people are working on in terms of open data and what does it mean in the Indian context. Um, the negative, the positives, and also like how do people measure impact by working with data. Um, so I've asked um, Anandes, who I can't find <laughs> Um, who does data visualizations, uh, works on Report B, just launched a company called Parameter that does online visualization tools, talk about working with, <coughs> working with data and making the expertise. He also is going to do a talk later. Um, Zainab, who has worked with CIS and done internal value research, uh, I believe you just finished your PhD, correct? Right? No, we're not talking about that. But, um, <laughs> on data and using data, um, openness of it, privacy issues, and all things. And if you were on the first here in and they have been working on how to make, how to create impact on the ground <coughs> using data, how to get data to people um, so that they can use it to improve their lives. So I'll ask them to come up. And it'll be, uh, we'll have them present for about five, 10 minutes. And then do a and do a Q and A, if, um, and that should be our our way we're gonna do this. So, yes. Uh, Anand, you want to go first? Uh, uh, what I do is just give you a few quick thoughts on um, data availability and data usage and usage. Those are two parts of the same equation. You've got data sitting there that you need to be able to find or people need to get out in the open. And then once you've got it out in the open, there's a question of what you want to do with it. My observation on data in India, especially when you're working with the public government data, is that it exists. Uh, on a number of occasions, when I tried to find data of specific kinds, so for instance, uh, I was at uh, Hakyam Branch London. And we were trying to see whether we could get the data from every city across the world. There was just this guy who was interested in weather data and was trying to pull it all together. And we were a bunch of geeks, uh, you know, Python meetup, and we figured, let's just create it. So I took India and that two pages to probably get what people had to get the information we put it together. So it is surprising, but that data. So, are you giving to the mic? Uh, so that data existed. Then at some point we started looking for energy data. Can we find energy supply data? What's the capacity of uh, the various reactors in the major states? We could get money to get the And in every single case, after about two or three days of digging, you find some site that has a simple patient information. So every 15 minutes, the, uh, the current production of every single reactor in every single state that I searched for exists online. Uh, crime data, uh, the national crime, uh, the NCRB data is available online for the last 50 years. For every single state, for every single IPC code, you have a breakup of what are the number of cases registered, what are the number of cases that have been processed, what state they are, how many convictions, every single piece of information is there. So I haven't till date found the case where I needed data <coughs> I didn't quite get it. Or a few occasions where that's happened, my life, maybe I just don't know where it is. So findability may be a problem. Availability may not be. Findability may be a problem, but availability may not be. But that findability is a, a fairly big issue. But, but in addition to findability, it's also the extractability. Where it's available, it's often available as PDFs. It may as well have been printouts. In fact, in some cases, they, they are printouts that are scanned, which is a problem. Uh, I think partly because uh, for, for instance, with NCERB, uh, we figured let's just take the effort and get all of this data onto Excel. And we got you know, maybe to help it out. It took us three full weeks to type out one year worth of data and choose it on the site. But still, uh, that's a fair bit of effort. And in most cases, even when the data is available, if it's not easy to use, people shy away from it. That's part of the problem. And that's 
for data that that's for the web page option where you actually be typing the data. Sometimes it's available on a web page as a table and you're trying to scrape it. The last time we had uh, like a sort of uh, a, a mini hackathon kind of thing where we were trying to scratch a scrape for data, for water related data. It wasn't easy. Uh, some of these sites on SharePoint are just not that available to scrape and even for someone who's badly comfortable with scraping something. So pulling the data out, even though it's available, is a pain. Now, the other main point that we have is the licensing of this data. For instance, uh, we approached NCERT and said, well, let's get the textbooks out of the open. Now, they're quite, they're, they're completely open to it. Uh, the data is available. Now, what worried us though was, there's a clause that says that all content, all the textbooks published by NCERT are copyright NCERT, and if you ever uh, do anything with it, then we will come after you quite strongly. But when I spoke to the head of uh, NCRT's uh, computer, it was completely open with it. The intent is to prevent those people who are trying to make it double in terms of money, who are trying to misuse it. So if you, for instance, try to put up a non profit with all the NCRT content, then no, they are not going to come after you. In fact, could we do that, could we do that with our business? We could we have an NCRT effort itself where you provide the technology to help and we get the data out of the way. So the reaction from the authority seems very open. Similarly for maps. Now, uh, the licensing today on any India related map is fairly stringent. But again, nobody believes that the government could come after the people and do it to the uh, Similarly, for the reasons like uh, the government after the state or the Indian University of Toronto website, put up with an open source license and he got this thing on the site saying, the reason I'm doing it is anyone who takes the data from my site, I mean, you know that the source is me. And you won't be paying for it because I put up the open source license. If the government does come after anybody, they will come after me. I will be the one point of failure. But still, it does prevent people from embedding some of that data into their projects. And the subsequent licensing of that becomes an issue. So, on data availability, if I look at the problem, data is available. It's not that easy to find or to use. And we're not entirely sure of the licensing. And if those problems get resolved, we'd we'll be in a better shape. But the flip side of it is data usage. Who uses the data? How do they? Where does it get used? How do you use it? Now, ultimately, this this data can tell lots of interesting stories. It can reach out to people in a way that tells them something new that they did not know before, and with a lot more backing than otherwise. Uh, there are two kinds of people that are broadly interested in doing something with this data. One is the domain I mean, experts, which could be either NGOs, the government, activists, or journalists or academicians who have an interest in the domain itself. And then there are the geeks who have the ability to play with this data. The overlap between these two communities is somewhat limited. Hopefully one of the things that a forum like this will do is to get together both these communities, get the people together who have the tools, who have the knowledge, to use uh, these techniques to ability to play the data, uh, but not necessarily an interest in, for instance, uh, that's it. Uh, if you take water as an example, I'm not someone who has a strong interest in data, but maybe in water, but if there's data, it's just one to take. So putting together these two communities is hopefully something that this will do. And that's happened on a number of occasions uh, outside India. Certainly the UK and the US are good examples where there are a number of hackathons, there are a number of contacts, uh, where there are a number of government agencies where it's going as volunteers. And there are these small little projects that keep coming up every now and then where Put together the data, you put together people that know how to read the story out of it and do the analysis on it and come up with something interesting. So, my hope is that while we've got the data sitting out there somewhere, we should, as this community, be able to extract, expose it better, be able to license it better, and tell stories out of it in a few minutes. Speak in the bite. <coughs> My name is uh, Nithya Raman, and I run an organization, a project housed at IFMR called Transparent Chennai. We aggregate, process, um, and actually create maps, data, and research about neglected issues in the city of Chennai. And we also work with residents to help them create data that can support them in their advocacy. Um, we are, uh, you know, basically a, a group that's focused on empowering residents to try and hold government accountable for service quality. But this has really been an uphill task, especially because I think the quality of city level data is much more problematic than much of the national level data that we have. I want to just highlight three lessons, or maybe um, three points, 
that might be useful for people here who are really focused on the question of data for data's sake. Um, and I want to talk about our experiences collecting uh, public toilets data in the city. Um, public toilets was something that repeatedly came up in our discussions with uh, groups of low-income workers. Um, it's an under-addressed issue in the city. And so we wanted to pull together some data about this. So, um, and actually our work documenting this issue has had some impact uh, because of reports that we've published and because of the ensuing publicity that this issue has um, received in the press. The State Planning Commission has actually um, included a report specifically on public toilets for the Indians in their, uh, their private plan that they're putting together right now, which I think is going to be a big change in terms of the way that toilets are planned in cities. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about the process of data collection for public toilets. So first we wanted to just get a total count of toilets in the city. And so for that we called the corporation um, and tried to find out which department <coughs> manage public toilets. And this actually was very difficult to find out. So we were passed around on the phone quite a bit, hung up on, um, and then finally we visited. And we were told that the buildings department was the um, agency that was in charge of toilets. Now when we called the buildings department, they told us that they maintain a no central register of toilets in the city at all. So there's no count of toilets at the Chennai Corporation headquarters. And they told us that we would then have to go to all the zones for this information. At that point, there were 10 zones in the city of Chennai. So I sent, we had an intern, one of our researchers, I sent her out to all the zones to collect this information. And at each zone, she faced a slightly different reception and a slightly different set of problems in terms of getting access to this list of toilets and their addresses. So she would go there with a letter of introduction from us. Um, most of the office addresses for the zonal offices themselves were not given very clearly. Um, so she spent a lot of time searching. Uh, you know, in, in certain zones, things were very easy. So she would go in, give them the letter of introduction, ask for the list of toilets. Uh, they would usually photocopy her request letter. Uh, the executive engineer would approve this and then put, let's say, a couple of engineers to writing a list of toilets. And often she would come back with a handwritten list of toilets and their addresses. Um, but in a couple of other zones, she faced a lot of problems. For example, in one zone, she met with the assistant commissioner after quite a long wait there. Um, he told her to come back after a week because the executive engineer was not in town. Then she came back after a week, again, uh, waiting for the to speak with the executive engineer. She gave him the letter, and despite it having been approved by the assistant commissioner, he was very suspicious and didn't want to give this information out to a member of the public. It seems like a fairly innocuous piece of information, so we were a little bit surprised. So Meryl, our researcher, pushed him. She said, you know, we've gotten this information from all the other zones. He said, no, I can't give it out to you without explicit permission from the corporation commissioner, that's the highest level of the bureaucracy in the city that means. He wanted a written letter from the corporation commissioner to give out a list of toilets in one zone of the city. Um, so Merrill pushed him again and said, look, every other zone has given this to us, please give it to us. We said, well, did you get it from zone nine? Um, and uh, she said, yes. So she call he called the executive engineer from zone nine, asked him whether he had actually given the list, and then satisfied that this was safe to give out to a member of the public, he finally gave the list. So when we collated this list of toilets from all the zones, what we found was that there were 572 toilets in the city, which we thought was an exceptionally small number, given that some 600, only 600,000 odd houses um, out of 800,000 total census houses in the 2001 census actually had a toilet within their house. So 572 public toilets seemed like a vast underprovision. So then we said, okay, releasing this data will get us in trouble regardless of what we do, even though we don't necessarily want this to be a fight with the government. Let's just file an RTI so we have a paper trail. Um, so that you know, if they ask us where we got this data, we can share, we can say that we actually did file an RTI. So then we filed an RTI, again, following up with the RTI actually took much longer than a month, um, <coughs> which it often does. We file RTIs all the time, and this is a problem that we face frequently. Um, and then, when we finally did get the list of toilets through the RTI from each of the zones, we found that every single zone had listed a different number of toilets than they had originally given us voluntarily. Every single zone. And what we found in some zones was that they had actually listed uh, less toilets and some were more. So in some zones they had listed imaginary toilets in their original counting. We had no idea what was happening. So then we decided to map toilets in one zone. 
um, just to get an idea of what was actually happening on the ground. And what we found was a further um, problem with the data, which was that many of the toilets that were listed were either completely dysfunctional and hadn't been functional for years and should never have been on that list in the first place, or that they were impossible to find, that they had an address, but they were located in different locations, whatever. Um, anyway, we put together that report, we released the findings, it had a, you know, quite a big impact in the city, and you know, we had good outcomes from it, and we continue to be lobbying on the issue of public toilets and how they should be planned. Now, why did I think that this story was important for this audience to hear? Um, I just want to draw from this, I think, three points which are important. One is that just passing a law on open data is not enough. We already have the RTI. And despite the RTI, every piece of data that we have to get from the government is uh, an uphill task, it's a Sisyphean task. Every piece of data. And we spend most of our time trying to get this data from the government. The other thing is that there's a culture in Chennai of fear among bureaucrats. There's lower level bureaucrats fear that they will be penalized for giving out data. This is despite the existence of the RTI, right? So what we need is, if we really want a future in which data from the city is actually publicly available for people to use, we need to ensure that we can support lower level bureaucrats to participate in this culture of openness without being penalized from their superiors. So we need more than just a law, we need advocacy and we need support from citizens for good bureaucrats who are doing, you know, who are actually supporting advocates in their work. The second thing is that I think we really have to be careful not to fetishize government data because of the number of holes that we've seen in almost every data set that we've worked with. It has holes for you know, many different reasons. In the public toilets data set, what we suspect is that many of the kind of the unlisted toilets or non-existent toilets that were listed were actually used as money generators for corporators who you know, gave out contracts for maintenance of those toilets. Um, but in other places, the lack of data actually helps the government to be more responsive to people in situations where the laws or uh, the kind of the bureaucracy to make changes to be responsive are very, very difficult. So for example, we found that there was huge holes in bus routes data in the city. And one of the reasons why we think that this was the case is because something that a government official told us there, which is that changing a bus route officially takes quite a long time. But we get, they get constant requests to change bus routes from residents, from politicians, from powerful people, and for just from people who want bus routes to be changed to accommodate their needs. And so not writing it down or not officially committing to a particular set of stops actually enables them to be more flexible and more responsive to people. So there are different reasons why this data is full of holes. But the point is that it's often full of holes. And so we have to be careful not to just take a data set and take it as the gospel truth. And then the final thing that I wanted to point out is that just having open data or a law for open data or data sets that are in the public eye does not necessarily mean accountability. The two are not the same. So for example, in Chennai, if we had just relied on the list of toilets from the government, what we would have had would have been a list of toilets. And yes, this list showed that there was a vast under-provision of toilets in the city. But when we did the mapping, what we found was something even worse, which is that almost none of the toilets were located in places of greatest need. They were not located in formal sector market areas, where there's obviously no toilets for customers to use. They were not located in big bus stops. They were not located near um, most of the informal settlements which had not been recognized by the city. So that means they were not on any government map, they were not on any government register. So in order for actually the government to improve its performance in terms of providing toilets to people, we needed much more data, data that the government would never have collected. Data on informal settlements that are unrecognized is never going to be collected by the government. That's just, it's just not going to happen. Same with informal market areas. Maybe, I mean, Ahmedabad recently just started doing some stuff with informal market areas. Maybe this is something that will happen in the future. But the point is that just government data is not going to guarantee um, a means for us to push the government towards better performance, at least at the city level in terms of providing local services. So I think that's all I have to say from my experience. So, um, I'm going to take off from uh, some of uh, the issues that Nitya raised over here, and let me start with toilet data. Um, uh, my experiences uh, of, of I, I actually do such a lot, um, I actually talk to a lot of frontline bureaucrats, uh, the clerks, the accountants, the engineers, uh, 
and um, I've actually found it very interesting to understand uh, uh, the way in which uh, uh, they decide to make decisions and therefore what gets recorded as written and what is not recorded uh, in the first place. So let me start with, with toilet data for instance. Um, uh, <coughs> so, uh, let me start with toilet data for instance. Uh, in Bombay, uh, sometime around in the early 2000s or the late 1990s, the World Bank decided to implement uh, this lung sanitation project where they decided that uh, they would fund uh, the, the construction of public toilets. Uh, and an NGO uh, called Spark decided to, uh, to, uh, uh, to implement these toilets. But in order to be able to uh, to implement the toilets in certain places, you had to first find out what were the what is the existing toilet infrastructure uh, and where uh, more toilets were needed and what settlements more toilets were needed and what settlements less toilets were needed and how and how they had to be positioned. So all these decisions with planning with infrastructure allocation, for that a survey had to be conducted. Now there was an organization named Yuva which decided to conduct the survey in the first place. And uh, it was a very tedious process because like we have pointed out, the data itself that the government gives to you is not accurate. It's not necessarily complete. It's got loopholes, and uh, so when you were decided to, to do the survey, the survey actually took a whole year to do. And uh, the problem really right now uh, with this whole idea of open data and uh, is really to do with uh, with the fact that what is really the ground level situation we do not know, and therefore what is the starting point that one needs to start with. So you did this whole survey for a year and uh, found out about where toilets are there, etc, etc. And that was supposed to serve as a baseline for Spark to be able to go and construct the toilets. Now, constructing a toilet is not just about using the data. It's also about being able to generate co consensus in different localities and in different settlements. And uh, in, in being able to say, okay, the toilet should be positioned here, there should be so many toilets for women, there should be so many toilets for children, how should the toilet be constructed, etc. Now, those decisions on the ground, that whole consensus process, does not necessarily be aligned with the data that is collected. Because the needs on the ground are completely different from what the data necessarily shows. It is at variance oftentimes, uh, particularly in this kind of infrastructure. And there are also different interests at stake over here. So one would say, what are the kind of interests that somebody would have in having a public toilet? It's the local leaders in the slum settlements who use the toilets to be able to generate uh, revenue out of it. And so if there is already an existing toilet situation, uh, I mean, if there's already an existing toilet uh, and they're already capitalizing through it, then implementing our toilet from a development perspective completely cuts into their own interest. Shekhar is sitting here and I'm hoping that he'll be able to talk more about this is a study that was conducted by CRIT. Uh, what was interesting for us to understand is what are the different kinds of interests at stake over here, even in the construction of public toilets. So when it comes to infrastructure, uh, there are clearly a lot of interests at stake. And it's not necessarily only the corrupt cooperator, or it's not necessarily the corrupt clerk, or the accountant, or the engineer. The interests span across different levels. I mean, in my own uh, research on rehabilitation and resettlement uh, allocation for uh, under, under huge infrastructure projects, one recognizes the corruption pervades at the level of the chief minister, it pervades at the level of the developmental authorities, but oftentimes that is not what is talked about. What is exposed is really this this uh, this petty corruption with frontline officials. So uh, the the issue that I want to point out over here, taking from Nithya's presentation, is that we do not necessarily know completely and clearly how is it that frontline officials make certain kinds of decisions when they have to allocate a water connection or when they have to uh, approve a plan. And I'm not saying over here that one has to treat the frontline officials as holier than thou, but one has to understand what are the kind of pressures that they face, not just from uh, the, the the applicant, but also from the whole structure of the bureaucracy. So it's completely true, as they pointed out, that frontline officials like clerks and bureaucrats and engineers are extremely skeptical of giving you anything in writing until the permission is not sought, because the question is that if they give it to you in writing, where will the accountability be? It, will it be them that will be penalized? And oftentimes it is them that is penalized when they are not necessarily the ones who have been responsible for making those decisions in the first place and therefore what they have recorded and given to you as data. Um, taking from here, I think the second uh, point that's sort of been of very interest to me in, in my own research is understanding this relationship between data, uh, publishing something as data, and this whole act of writing and documenting. And therefore this whole relationship between open data and law. Well, I believe that uh, what is very critical at the moment, if something is sort of is, is published online or is given to you in writing, it acquires a certain kind of validity, a certain kind of truth value, 
and it has a certain kind of evidence value at some point. So somebody can say, oh, I got this written, and if one sort of traces also how the RTI validates the information uh, that you get, it has to be stamped, sealed, and signed and given to you. So that tomorrow in a court of law or in any dispute, you can use this and say, well, you know, it was officially sealed, stamped, and signed and given to me. Now, this relationship between open data and law is something that's been very of, of interest to me. Now, what happens when you decide to cull out certain information represented as data and publish it in a certain way? <coughs> what kind of what kind of a legal architecture now develops around it? Uh, well, how does the court recognize it? How do you recognize now? How do you use that data in the process of dispute? I do not have clear answers to this, but this is also where my discomfort with this whole idea of blanket open data is. That if you decide to go and publish uh, information, uh, online or in writing or in any other form, uh, in any documented form. Uh, what, how does it tend to get used? How is it represented? What kind of precedence is it really setting in terms of law? So I think this is a question that we should always be aware of because it's not just a question that affects an informal settlement, it's also a question that affects me as a property holder, as a recipient of government services, as somebody who has a particular register of identity as a Muslim and things like that. Uh, and. Uh, Following from this, uh, this this sort of complex relationship between between open data and law is also a question of how, through this process of of, of, of representing data or culling data in a certain way and putting it in writing, how are we really also rep sort of reconfiguring the identities of citizens in, in certain ways. And I'm not necessarily saying over here in the sense of, of uh, I'm not I'm not saying this from a notion of paranoia, but I'm trying to also trace back uh, from from the British period itself. How different acts by the British in terms of categorizing uh, uh, certain kinds of land types or categorizing certain population groups as this is a particular caste and this is not a particular caste and this is a certain socioeconomic identity. How does how do those historical precedents now play out in the present? So in a certain way, one has to sort of uh, make a very strong argument. The current uh, move even towards open government data can be looked upon as a continuation of the British project to govern subjects um, and and to be able to create certain kinds of categories, which is not entirely. <coughs> Uh, let's take the example of crime data, for instance. I've done some research in Johannesburg in South Africa, and there is, uh, if, if one has been in Johannesburg, it's probably the most dangerous place to be in the world. I don't know about Iraq, I don't know about Kashmir, but everybody wants to uh, warn you and say how you will get raped and how you will get murdered and how you will get mugged at every point in time. Now, what's interesting to me in a city like Johannesburg is this. There's been a full history of, of, of racial discrimination. In the 1990s, with the coming of the African National Congress, this discrimination does not necessarily go away because it has a whole history. It's ingrained in your everyday stereotypes. Even for me, when I'm walking in a street, my first fear is if I see a black person coming in and saying, oh, is this guy going to mug me? Who knows? So uh, so this kind of, 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 of also the kind of consciousness we carry into ourselves in terms of marking who is criminal and who is not criminal. And then if one sort of has to talk about open government data or the, <laughs> in the context of, of crime data, what are the areas that then get marked as having crime spots? Uh, are these the areas that have been historically discriminated as black, as poor, etc. I mean, my own research in Soweto, for instance, showed how uh, the whole mapping process really ended up reproducing certain parts of Soweto as being criminal. Uh, and so my concern really also is that when we are talking about when we're talking about representation away, when we're talking about about putting information in a certain way, are you then continuing this historical practice of marginalizing various communities? I think there's a lot of very interesting historical literature out there which talks about how communities have been marginalized historically by the by the British, by different governments, and whether that continues in the present as a result of open data. I think that's another question that one has to be uh, one has to stay with. That then leads me to the other issue of uh, the data itself. I mean, I, I, Anand pointed out this, this thing about uh, that you, the data can tell stories, that meanings can be made of data. The question also is who is making those meanings out of data? And I think that's also a question that we have to stay aware with. And following from here, therefore, the issue of whether one can talk about open data only in the context of equality. I do not think so. I think it's not about open data and equality, <coughs> but recognizing what kind of a story is told and therefore what kind of leverage or position does it give to a certain group in society as a result of it. So if one looks at politics really as this kind of shifting dynamics where I am able to generate a certain meaning out of a story and therefore use it in a certain way at a certain moment in time, then I think it's interesting to sort of then understand and even assess uh, whatever we want to call as impact of open data. So I think this notion of trying to, to, to equate open data with equality is something that we really now need to kind of move away from and look at uh, what really, uh, how different groups are really using this data, how are they accessing the, this data, and how are they then using this data to represent themselves. To give a very quick example uh, before just uh, the last couple of points, uh, I was working, uh, one of the research uh, that, that we did was to understand uh, 
how uh, how ICTs are are, are positioned now in uh, helping people to access information. And we ended up researching this uh, this this tribal group, uh, which had a whole history of of, of being a nomadic group. So they would keep traveling from one place to another. And for them, communication was a very critical thing. How do you communicate and pass information uh, to each other when you're traveling at different points in time? And interesting how they've taken to mobile phones as a result of this. They use mobile phones as a historical practice now of being able to transmit information. <coughs> They're currently embroiled in a certain land-related conflict, and for them, using a map to be able to represent and tell their story to the world is also a way in which to push it with the government and say that this is our situation and to be able to build that kind of a support. I'm not necessarily, again, talking about here in terms of uh, a, a certain positive impact, but but just to sort of make a point that there are certain ways in which different groups decide to use data in a certain way to get, to get certain kinds of visibilities in certain moments of conflict, in certain moments of negotiation with the state. So following from here, just a, a few last points. Um, I think that one has to be aware of the fact that data is not necessarily neutral. Information <coughs> is political. Even putting up information about land-related values has mm -hmm. certain kinds of economics at stake, has certain kinds of uh, politics at stake. And I often know that a lot of people talk about how we need to make this information about land values clear. What happens when you make the information clear in the first place is you reduce the perception of risk, therefore. And therefore, that completely even escalates the value of the land on the ground, even if there's not necessarily that kind of infrastructure at place over there. So information is political in the sense of who's using the information, how they're using it. And by saying information is political, I don't mean to say, okay, now we need to stop all this and end the camp over here. It's not the case. But it's a recognition of the fact that at no point in time, data is neutral. Uh, the second uh, point that I want to make over here is whether it's really a question of accountability, uh, which sort of Nithya also pointed out, in terms of uh, how data is represented, who gives you this data, how do you use this data. I think the question is not necessarily one of accountability, uh, because the accountability question is skewed over here in the sense that if somebody gives you something in writing, then is it them who's responsible for what has been given to you, when the decisions are not necessarily made by them. I believe the question is really one of responsiveness. In terms of how can you now use this information to petition different avenues to be able to get what you think is your claim or be able to get something which is your entitlement. So I believe there's a question of responsiveness, a question also of trust in the sense of will more open data really enable a climate of trust? I'm not sure at this point and I think it's a question that we need to ask. And I think the final point really uh, has to do with, with this whole life of data. I believe that there's a short life of data, there's a long life of data. That is that what reveals to you in the present immediately may not necessarily hold true in the long run. Let me give you a very quick example. I worked with an organization in Bombay called Praja and we developed this online complaint management system where we would collect a lot of data about complaints uh, that were registered uh, around Sorry, civic issues. In the short run, every month we would download our MIS reports and send it to NGOs and to, advo uh, to advocates and we would send it to citizens. And all that it showed is municipality is not responsive, they are corrupt, they are not responding to complaints, they are saying complaints are resolved and it's closed and this and that. So in the short run, it really became this kind of conflictual, it, it sort of became perpetuating the kind of conflictual relationship between the citizens and municipality. In the long run, that is about three years later, when we started to look at the whole trends in the data, one of the things that we found was interestingly a few departments in the municipality like, like sewage, uh, like sanitation, like water, had actually learned uh, through this data to arrest a problem before it became chronic. So for instance, there was a pipe that was repeatedly sort of uh, giving a leak. Now, they over a period of time realized that you know, if this pipe is sort of repeatedly giving a leak, there is a problem and this problem can become chronic in the sense that there could be a pipe burst, etc. We found that the municipality, uh, some, some of the departments and officials were actually using that data to arrest a problem before it became chronic in the first place. And that we could only determine about three years later. So I'm, I'm also hoping maybe Anand can sort of respond to, to this if, if in your own experience in the sense of this long life and short life of data. Um, so I think with this... Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks so much. That was great. If Anand, you want to respond? But um, I kind of want to hear from the group if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, all these issues that you uh, described in the beginning about data, what kind of impact it has in terms of um, the argument you can make with the data, right? And if it becomes public, can somebody create a story around it that um, may or may not be true, right? But does, doesn't all of this uh, only apply to journalists or pseudo journalists doing blogging? I mean, all you need is a small piece of evidence and you can create an entire story around that evidence. So data just becomes another argument that must be dealt with almost exactly the same day. Um, 
So I, 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 I agree with your point and I'm, I'm going to like answer by thinking aloud. Um, let me sort of try and, and, and string two or three answers together. Uh, I have largely worked with open government data in very specific uh, 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 experiences and very specific sectors. Uh, I believe that there, is, there are other lives to data. For instance, uh, one of the things that fascinated me was also how uh, front-hand location data is now being used. For instance, what JustBooks is now doing with their data in terms of mapping. Uh, not just in terms of what are the best sellers, but also what are uh, the, the kind of books that people want to read, which don't necessarily feature a best seller list. Or even in terms of like finding out uh, in different areas what kind of languages uh, are used more in the neighborhood and therefore what kind of books do a library have to stock. So I believe that there are different uh, there are different lives of data, not just in terms of the short life and long life, but I mean different kinds of data that are circulating around. At this moment, at least my own familiarity is with open government data, which is why what I want to do now is to understand data in different uh, spheres in different aspects. Because there's also business that's seen as a sort of kind of opportunity in data and what they categorize as data. So I want to sort of uh, flag this issue over here that what we're talking about over here is a, a specific sphere of data, but there are other spheres in which data is being generated. And that can have different kinds of implications in terms of what I have just said over here. What I'm talking about here applies only to open government data. Uh, the second uh, issue really is about what you pointed out in terms of who's making meaning and, and streaming it as evidence and presenting it out there. Uh, that remains an issue. Uh, and clearly at this point in time, I don't have a response in terms of saying how is it that we should deal with it. But uh, one of the issues. But wouldn't that, it be the same, th same way as we deal with, say, a blogger taking a small piece of. So, information and creating a story. So I think really at that point in time it's also a matter of like who's kind of using that information also in particular kinds of ways. Uh, who decides to so, so for instance somebody uh, recently came and made this presentation about the Matki Vera project where uh, she talked about how uh, this information is actually being uh, culled out from Kibera which is a large club in Kenya and is represented online to be able to negotiate the state in a certain kind of way. But that information is not necessarily generated by the community out there, which is what she said. It's not that the people in Kibera are participating in creating that information. But that information is out there, and there are ways in which you can read it, and I can read it, and, and think about Kibera in certain ways. So that, that remains, uh, and I don't necessarily have a response to your question. I think what we need to uh, to stay with and understand is whether what is projected as data is really evidence in the first place. Uh, and, and therefore, I'm raising these questions about the fact that we really don't know how decisions are made on the ground. And therefore, how do you now read the data against the grain of the ground over here? So I think that's that's really where I come, uh, come from. Right. Between data stories and uh, journalistic stories, which is that the data can be made open, which allows other people to use the same data to come up with their own stories. And that sometimes provides a twist to the story. For instance, I've seen one story with migration data, which identifies for instance marriage as the primary cause of migration. Uh, but then further analysis then shows that that has that is on the decline. Now, the latter is something that came out of subsequent analysis of the data, it was not carried to the original story. So, and then somebody else would then have the opportunity to say, oh, if you bring that up by uh, age, then you know, that could be something. So, yeah, correlation versus causation is a eager problem with data analysis, and a lot of people misinterpret the whole, this, because these two lines look the same, they're a cause, right? And that thing, well, but if the data is provided, so <coughs> that's the opportunity to take a little bit of fresh out of price, that's the problem. Thank you. Yeah. Regarding this, uh, yeah. Yeah. regarding this uh, thing about open data and issues of profiling and labeling, I, I can also kind of you know think of a concrete example where the entire issue, this entire discourse on digitalization in Europe and how the public data which was available allowed scholars to question this concept of ghettoization showing the level of multiculturalism that exists in ghettos. It's the outside that's more ghettoized than the inside of the ghetto. So that's one point. And the second thing is the entire discussion we have had. I mean, we do mark out the state in terms of uh, the state being the re repository of data and the struggle that we have with the state. But just a month back, a private corporation like Elsevier came under severe censure from the entire scholar, the academia, when they boycotted Elsevier because of the way they were blocking access to journals. If you try and access a journal paper on Elsevier, it's nothing less than $35 of paper, and that's a hell of a lot of money we're talking about for anybody who wants to access data. And some of this data is much more reliable, much better than the government data we are all dying for. 
So this entire discourse of the private data that's there, somewhere also needs to get debated a little bit. Yes. I think uh, uh, maybe I should step. <laughs> uh, this is related to the uh, you know last point that you were making. Uh, how do we let's say predict some of the stuff, right? So there are three aspects, I guess. One is collecting the data. Uh, second is analyzing, and then third is visualizing. I think you guys are very good at it. Uh, so I think in, in, apparently we are working on a POC with the water leakage data and then the points there. Um, now, using this data, I think it is possible, and uh, using some of the techniques uh, like predictive analysis, right, predictive analytics, to uh, predict some of these stuff, like, you know, where could there be a leakage, and there is some associated data which comes along with this, just the pure leakage data, time of the pipe, how old age of the pipe, and so on and so forth. So I think all this can be put together to basically do some of the predictive analysis. So there were point of response to this. Uh, I was recently taking classes uh, on uh, the economic history of India, just trying to understand the whole pattern of industrialization and deindustrialization in India. Uh, one of the things that I find uh, that, may, that that it, that could be very useful um, in, in open government data advocacy is also to be able to trace this whole history of of data. If, if, if you are sort of, and I don't mean like all data, but even if you're working with water data, land data particularly is extremely historical. How has it really been from the past? Also, how are the different regulations and all changes as a result of which uh, certain kinds of officials and bureaucrats make certain kinds of decisions? And therefore, what has really come to be in the present? I find that that historical perspective is, 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 is strongly missing at this point in time. And the reason why I feel that it's important to go back to it is to be able to understand how through the past, the present has come to be the way it is to be, because there are certainly continuities from the past. So, um, uh, and I find, I mean, if I was sort of raising this question where in economic history, one of the ways in which you sort of uh, present your research is by doing very thick works in archives, where you look at a lot of uh, past material uh, and, and, and then talk about how at different points in time, different groups and individuals and institutions have made certain kinds of decisions. Now, if one has to then compare this with the methodology in economics, how would economics then use the history of the past to represent the present? So, I think there's a methodology issue also over here, and I didn't flag it because, uh, uh, I mean, I didn't want to sort of like keep going on in different directions, but this is something I've also been thinking about in terms of what are the methods in which you, you sort of like read the contemporary, you read the present, and also how do you assess uh, what you think is impact? Uh, because clearly it's not necessarily just one form of impact. There are different groups that are sort of using the data in different kinds of ways. So for instance, in the research that we did on, on ICT kiosks uh, on the outskirts of Bangalore, uh, there was no one way in which uh, people had benefited through the digitized land records. Different people, depending on where their own socioeconomic location, they felt the data was correct. Now for a small farmer, there's a problem because he has to then use this information uh, to, to make certain kind of changes in the record if the digital information has recorded his name incorrectly or his measurement incorrectly. For him, he would say it's injustice, the new digital kind of the system. So I think uh, it's also useful maybe uh, in the course of the day also to have a certain kind of discussion around what do you see as as, as being impact of this open data on the ground? Also, what are the criteria that you use to assess what you see as impact? I think this is going to become a critical issue uh, as as time goes on because then there'll be questions of cost and sustainability of, of open data projects. <coughs> so why should you fund a certain kind of an open data project uh, if it's not producing a certain kind of impact? I think these are sort of related uh, issues. Uh, yeah. The point that you mentioned on predictive uh, analysis, I think that's an important one here. Uh, working with the energy utility, uh, trying to see if they can predict what the energy is going to be tomorrow in the year and to open up the pipeline. Some of this, of course, requires a bit of sophistication that is beyond most, uh, in fact, in general, beyond most people. So, for instance, we found that after having updated all of the basic models on predictor analytics, a simple best predictor for tomorrow's energy usage at 2 o'clock is simply to see what is today's usage at 2 o'clock. That happens to have a predictive accuracy of your error rate will be less than 2%, which is something that they've known for a long time. But then, what we're looking at is trying to see if we can take a subset of that data, open it up as a competition, see if anyone can come up with a better predictive model. And there are enough sites, for instance, like Gadget, uh, that allow <coughs> people to publish data sets. There are enough educational institutions that want their students to work on such data sets. And we, I mean, uh, people in the utilities, in uh, the government, are willing to open up some data sets, semi-anonymized, to make this sort of a thing possible. 
I suspect that it's partly about sharing with them what can be done, how it can be done, and then it will start taking off even more. But even already, it's happening. And I think that's a great thing. <laughs> okay, um, we are on time, so I would like to continue that trend. Um, but I just wanted to um, say thank you. For, they raised a lot of really good questions that we should think about throughout the day as we talk about the work we're doing, but also what is what is behind the work and what is the point of the work. And I really want to emphasize the idea of the informal versus the formal in this country, which is a, the informal world here is very strong, and data is a formal thing. So there is this discrepancy that exists here and how, how can data help and how can data not help. And I think that's a really good um, topic to kind of think about as we go through our sessions. Um, also that, you know, data is not a silver bullet for a lot of things. And I think that has been um, a good thing to kind of note. But it's one of those things that's a good point to start at. And I think what Anand will say and Nithya and Zeno is that you have to not take it as um, the golden truth, but use it as a point to say, okay, what's actually happening and how do we figure out uh, what we need in addition to this data to, uh, to find out how to make impact and to improve the lives that we are living. So I'm going to close this panel. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please save them for the end, and then close the page. Okay. Um, and we will go to the next, I'll take a little short break, and we'll go to the next panel.